Hi everyone, uh, welcome uh, to uh, ACS's uh, annual Supreme Court preview. As many of you know, yesterday was the, uh, the first day of the 2015 term for the Supreme Court. Um, for everyone who's here, or if you're here, I'm sure you're kind of a nerd about this stuff, so I'm sure you also know that last uh, term started off a little slow and then it uh, turned out to have a lot of blockbuster decisions, marriage equality, um, we had the Obamacare cases, just a lot of stuff happened. Um, and so we want to preview it again this year. Um, but before we do that, um, Professor Schmidt uh, will be giving us a little recap of what happened last year. Um, and then Professor Neymar, uh will be uh, giving us uh, one uh, particularly interesting case um, that will come before the court in the coming term. Um, and just uh, a little note, you guys have already found the pizza, but uh, feel free to take uh, as much as possible. Um, and also, uh, check out the, uh, the new OEA uh, website. Um, they just did a redesign. Uh, it looks really nice. Um, and again, if you're at all interested in the Supreme Court, then this is one of the, uh, the must-see sites. It's hosted here at our school, Chicago Kent. I think it's uh, one of the really cool things that we do, so uh, you know, check it out. And without further ado, we'll turn it over to Professor Schmidt. Hello, thank you all for coming. So, can you all hear me back there? Uh, so today, Professor Neymar, Professor Neymar and I are going to do a little back and forth show. I'm going to start off by discussing some of what went on last term and how to understand the significance of last term. I think we can all agree was one of the most significant Supreme Court terms in recent memory. And then I'll just tee up some of the uh, basic issues the Supreme Court will be looking at this coming term. First, name I will talk more closely about one of those cases, and then I'll talk um, a little more generally about a couple of the other cases that we're looking forward to, and then we're hoping to have a general discussion with everyone in the room. So looking back at last term of the Supreme Court, generally the assessment that people had at the end of June last year, or this year, a few months ago, was that the October term of 2014 was a big victory for liberals. And this was a liberal term. Uh, even during a period of a generally conservative Roberts Court. Now, in order to even think about this question, but what does it mean to have a liberal term or a conservative court? Uh, it is worth just stopping briefly to talk about what we mean by these categories of liberal and conservative, because there's two different ways we can think about this. One is we can think about judicial ideology. What is the judicial ideology of particular justices? And that would clearly differentiate uh, different groups, some grayer in the middle on the Supreme Court, Whereas the conservatives and liberals differ on just basic issues of legal and constitutional interpretation. And they should be familiar to people out here uh, with liberals generally being more supportive of federal authority, more open to civil rights claims, more skeptical toward rights for corporations and constitutional claims against economic regulation, and conservatives generally getting on the other side of this issue. When we talk about conservative and liberal in the current court, we also have to talk about politics, too. There's a lot of discussion about Democratic and Republican appointees to the court. And indeed, if we look at the, political, the ideological breakdown of the court and the political breakdown, the one thing that's very distinctive to the current court is that they directly align, which means that the most conservative justices on the court are all appointees by Republican administrations, and the most liberal justices are all appointees by Democratic administrations. This is really the first time in Supreme Court history where their alignment has been so neat and clear. So I'm going to talk in these general terms about the conservative and liberal court. Those are generally the concepts I'm talking about, and the alignment actually does go along with the partisan uh, divide. And we can talk more in Q&A about how to characterize uh, some of these justices and some of these decisions. So the general question I want to start off with is, was last term indeed a good term for liberals? And the answer there, I think, has to be yes, but it needs to be uh, a more qualified yes than I think some people generally assume. If you just measure the outcome of cases, then it's certainly yes. Liberals won more in their fairs, big cases. You have a lot of cases in which the liberal block of justices uh, Kagan, Sotomayor, Ginsburg, and Breyer were able to pull over one or two of the more conservative justices, oftentimes Justice Kennedy, and win cases with majorities put together with that, uh, that grouping. So just looking at the case level, yes, the liberals won a lot of the big cases. But that's not the only measure by which you might think about, is this a good term for liberals or for conservatives? Another way you might want to think about it is, well, what kind of changes do you have to the legal status quo? If it's really a good liberal term, then you'd imagine that the legal status quo the situation out there would have shifted in a more liberal or progressive direction. And if you evaluate the question on this way, that's where you get the more qualified response 
to what actually happened last term. It's more qualified good term for liberals. Because in fact, most of these liberal victories that you can identify in the Supreme Court last term were really more <coughs> in the way of uh, rejections to conservative challenges to the legal status quo. Liberals, in other words, were dodging bullets. And they did so very successfully last term. Two primary examples I'll mention, and the longest one, but two ones that really stand out, would be the, the, uh, the challenge to the Affordable Care Act in King versus Burwell, in which there's a challenge to a law based upon statutory interpretation that would, if the challengers had their way, basically undermine the entire logic of the Affordable Care Act and put into what was called a death spiral, and the Affordable Care Act would basically not work. Uh, this was a challenge that a lot of people thought was a long shot challenge at the beginning. And about a year ago, people thought there's no way the Supreme Court is going to take this up. They, in fact, did take this, uh, and they argued through the case, and it was seen as a major threat to the, um, the ongoing success of the Affordable Care Act. And in the end, this is a decision which Chief Justice Roberts offered an opinion for six of the justices rejecting this particular challenge to the Affordable Care Act. Another case which fits this model of um, a return to the status quo or, do or liberal dodging bullets would be a challenge to a particular reading of the Fair Housing Act of 1968. This would be a challenge to uh, what's called a disparate impact interpretation of the Fair Housing Act, which just comes down to what the standard proof is going to be when trying to demonstrate discrimination under the Fair Housing Act. Uh, ever since the Fair Housing Act, the courts have generally interpreted it a certain way, which is they allow these disparate impact claims to go forward. This allows a lot more litigation to take place under the Fair Housing Act. The challenger said, no, you can't do this anymore. Uh, again, this is seen as a significant challenge to establish law in this area. And this is another case in which the liberals dodged a bullet. In this case, Mrs. Kennedy wrote the opinion for the court saying that, no, we're going to continue to read the law the way we've been doing. So again, a liberal victory. So this is a liberal victory, which basically says it's not a conservative victory. It's a return to the legal status quo. So it does say something, I would suggest, about the ideological climate of the day that so many of these liberal court victories are really defensive victories. They preserve the status quo. Victory in these cases means minimizing losses. Now, of course, looking back at last term, there is one big, huge exception, and that is the same-sex marriage case of Obergefell versus Hodges. In this case, the court clearly was not returning to any sort of legal status quo. The court was forging ahead, creating new law. New law, I think we can all agree, was in a liberal or progressive direction. So this, if you want to look back at last term and say that this was indeed a liberal victory, a liberal term. The liberals did well last term. You'd want to identify most of the victories were in fact preserving the law it was, pushing back conservative challenges to existing law, but then the same-sex marriage case really is a breakthrough decision. One last case I just want to mention from last term before we turn our attention to this upcoming term, and that is a death penalty case that the court saw last term called Lassa versus Gross. This is not a direct challenge to the death penalty, the constitutionality of the death penalty. It's a challenge to a method of execution which is used in Oklahoma. A uh, lethal <coughs> injection protocol that is used in Oklahoma was challenged as being a violation of the Eighth Amendment's prohibition on cruel and unusual punishment. In this case, as most observers predicted, the challengers lost, meaning, in this case, the conservatives, uh, conservative justices won the case, saying, that it does not violate the Eighth Amendment, the particular drug protocol that Oklahoma was using, even though there was some evidence that in certain instances this was causing a high level of pain in people that Oklahoma was trying to execute. So this doesn't fit that model of a liberal victory that tended, uh, that uh, captures much of what happened last term. But the interesting thing about this Glossop case is it included one of the most significant developments if you're interested in the constitutionality of death penalty, which is Justice Breyer wrote a uh, dissent which he dissented to the majority opinion, which upheld Oklahoma's uh, method of execution. But in his dissent, he actually argued that there's a strong case to question the constitutionality of the death penalty. This is something the Supreme Court, for a short period of time, back in the 1970s, came pretty close to saying that the death penalty is unconstitutional in the Eighth Amendment. And just as Breyer, in this opinion, again, it's not binding law, it's just a, it's a dissenting opinion, um, does seem to indicate that he thinks it's time to have another discussion about the constitutionality of death penalty. So again, returning to my general question about how do we characterize this term, I think it's important to recognize that even in some of these conservative victories, uh, the liberals, particularly with this opinion by Justice Breyer, really did plant a seed, which a lot of critics of the death penalty, a lot of people who think that we should have a discussion about the constitutionality of death penalty, see this as a possible moment to really resurrect this <coughs> argument. Now looking ahead to this term, so how do we look at this term as it's shaping up 
in comparison to last term. Uh, I think it's pretty clear that this term is not going to be uh, like last term, either in the high level significance of the cases. If nothing else, we have the same sex marriage case, uh, nothing comparable to that in their work. Um, I think it also is probably going to be a situation in which we're not going to be coming back here a year from now and talking about the great liberal term the Supreme Court just had. We have a lot of cases coming up this term that fit into that general model I was talking about, which is a conservative challenge to existing law, and then the question is what's the court going to do? A liberal victory in these cases will largely be pushing back a challenge. A conservative victory would be changing the law in a more conservative direction. So let me just flag four areas of law in which the Supreme Court will be looking at cases that fit this model. And then Professor Neymar is going to talk about one of these cases, and I'll come back to me and I'll talk about a couple of the other ones. The four areas include affirmative action, which Professor Neymar is going to talk about. Also public sector union dues, uh, whether they're going to change the uh, availability of certain union dues to um, public sector unions. There's a voting rights case, again, challenge to existing law. And then also there's a high likelihood that the Supreme Court is going to take an abortion case. Uh, there's some challenges to abortion regulations that are coming up that it looks like the Supreme Court is going to take, although they haven't taken yet. But I'll talk about those in a few minutes. Now, Mr. Thank you, Chris. Is this working? It should be working now. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm delighted to be here with my colleague. Appreciate the invitation from the ACS, uh, one of the premier student organizations at this law school. I never turn down an offer from them because I get paid so much. <laughs> I'm going to talk about uh, the uh, new, but not so new, as you'll see, uh, affirmative action case before the United States Supreme Court. We'll call it Fisher II. But before, uh, in order to do that intelligently, I've got to provide a bit of a primer for people on affirmative action, equal protection, and the like, so bear with me on this. Uh, first, what is affirmative action and what is it not? It is not, uh, emphatically, uh, doesn't involve a situation where a court has found evidence of racial discrimination and it has entered a uh, race-conscious remedy. That is not affirmative action. Affirmative action uh, involves situations in which governmental bodies, state, local, national, have voluntarily uh, undertaken uh, to engage in uh, uh, race-conscious uh, behavior in order to accomplish certain goals that we'll talk about in a moment. It is also very important in order for you to understand uh, what the possibilities are in the Supreme Court with affirmative action with Fisher II, you have to have some understanding of equal protection uh, and uh, different levels of scrutiny. Purposeful racial discrimination triggers what is called strict scrutiny. Uh, if it's invidious, the reason for strict scrutiny, which means that the government has the burden of coming forward with a compelling governmental interest, and then in terms of the means inquiry, to show narrow tailoring. Uh, racial classifications trigger strict scrutiny because we are suspicious of government. We want to make sure that the political process has worked in a fair way, and given the history of racial classifications, invidious racial discrimination, uh, that makes a great deal of sense. That's um, uh, strict scrutiny for invidious racial discrimination. There is also uh, intermediate level scrutiny, which is not going to occupy today, but that's for sex discrimination. And then everything else is rational basis review, which is incredibly deferential. The major point, a major point about strict scrutiny in the racial classification setting is that it places a burden on government to justify the racial classification. You will notice that I said invidious racial uh, discrimination, invidious racial classifications. The argument has been made uh, that uh, strict scrutiny should not apply to so-called beneficial uh, racial classifications, i.e. Uh, affirmative action, because it does not stigmatize the way uh, invidious racial discrimination does. The Supreme Court rejected an argument several decades ago in the affirmative action setting in the Croson case. The Supreme Court said there's a kind of parity that we use in affirmative action cases. Uh, comparable to the standard of review, strict scrutiny, 
the level of scrutiny that we use <coughs> in invidious racial discrimination cases. Because there are dangers with using racial classifications generally, whether they're supposedly uh, beneficial or invidious, and there are also innocent persons who may be disadvantaged by the use of uh, uh, beneficial uh, racial classifications. Before the Supreme Court handed down the Grutter case, uh, the only compelling governmental interest in affirmative action cases was the interest in remedying past racial discrimination. That was it in Croson and his progeny. And the idea was that if the governmental body wished to engage in an affirmative action plan, it had to do a kind of mea culpa. It had to say, yes, we have sinned in the past. We have engaged in purposeful racial discrimination, and now what we are doing is remedying that racial discrimination with a race-conscious remedy. And that typically takes place, took place in the context of uh, employment. Then came the Grutter case, University of Michigan Law School case, and its companion, the Gratz case, the University of Michigan uh, College uh, admission uh, case. The Supreme Court held in an opinion by, uh, by Justice O'Connor that another compelling governmental interest in the education setting is diversity. Uh, it's diversity of all kinds of which racial, racial diversity was a, uh, was a, a part. Uh, the court didn't go into great detail in discussing what diversity uh, was. Uh, but what uh, is noteworthy is that in the Grutter case itself, which upheld the University of Michigan Law School affirmative action plan, the court found, and these points I'm going to make now are key to understanding what's going to happen, what might happen in Fisher, racial quotas are not allowed. Racial balancing is not allowed. The key is that race can be a factor as part of a, an overall holistic approach in university admissions. It's one of many factors. It cannot be determinative. That is another consideration to keep in mind, which is why the Supreme Court came out the other way in the Gratz case, where in terms of the University of Michigan admissions generally, not the law school, so much weight was given, given to race that it effectively meant that someone who was a racial minority would almost automatically, would almost always, uh, get get in. Another consideration in the Grutter in the Grutter case was that uh, the Supreme Court, in this opinion by Justice O'Connor, uh, said we will defer to university on the issue of when we have a critical mass of racial minorities <coughs> such that diversity uh, is promoted. Uh, O'Connor wrote the opinion. Justice Kennedy dissented in Grutter. And you should know that Justice Kennedy has never voted to uphold an affirmative action case, so far as I know. So here is Fisher. Fisher is a very interesting case uh, in many ways. Uh, historically, before the Grutter case came down, the uh, Texas legislature and the University of Texas, in order to achieve a racially diverse uh, uh, student body at the University of Texas, the flagship school in Austin, came up with a top 10 program. The top 10% of all graduates of uh, Texas uh, high schools would be admitted to the University of Texas. And that uh, amounted to, uh, brought about a fair amount of diversity, 10 or 15% or so, of diversity in the racial minority diversity in the uh, entering uh, class at, uh, at UT. So that was supposedly race neutral. It wasn't race conscious. So there was no equal protection problem there. Then after the <coughs> University of Texas did that, uh, Grutter came down. And the University of Texas uh, said, we need to do more because now we can use race as one factor. So here's the point that you need to remember, be aware of. The top 10% covered 80% of the entering class at UT. The University of Texas 
wanted to use a holistic approach for the other 20% of the entering class. And by holistic, I mean something that has been called occasionally the Harvard plan. You take into account, you make an individual assessment of each and every student, and one factor, one permissible factor, may be raised, but there are a whole lot of other factors that can be taken into account. Uh, you consider each student as an individual. So what the University of Texas did was say, hey, guess what? We want to provide, get this now, diversity within diversity, because the top 10% uh, get students from a certain uh, racial minority students from a certain social economic milieu, but students, uh, racial minority students who have gone to integrated schools may not have done so well and therefore won't get in on the top 10% program, but we want to give them the opportunity to uh, get in on a holistic approach. And that was what came before the United States Supreme Court in Fisher in 2013, and remember I talked a moment ago about strict scrutiny and I talked about compelling governmental interest and narrow tailoring. What the Supreme Court held, uh, reversing the Fifth Circuit, was that the Fifth Circuit did not apply the narrow tailoring approach satisfactorily or rigorously enough when it upheld the uh, holistic approach for the other 20% of the class. There was no challenge at all, you understand, to the top 10%, because that's race neutral. The question was only the constitutionality of the holistic approach for the other 20% of the entering, uh, entering uh, class. What's also interesting to note about Fisher uh, 1, which is what I'll call this now, uh, and I say it was reversed and remanded to the Fifth Circuit and the District Court to do a little better with the application of the narrow tailoring part of strict scrutiny. What is also uh, important uh, to note is that the parties in Fisher 1 and similarly the parties in Fisher 2 did not ask that Grutter be overruled. In Fisher 1, Scalia and Thomas wanted to overrule Grutter and wanted to say that uh, racial diversity or diversity in, in general is not a compelling governmental interest. Let me put this more strongly. That race can never be used constitutionally as a factor, period. That's what they wanted the court to say, but it was, uh, it was not to be. So, uh, Ms. Fisher, uh, who has since uh, graduated, uh, I think she graduated a couple of years ago, raises an interesting question of standing and mootness, and from what I understand, she's got standing perhaps because she paid a fee. She was turned down at the University of Texas. She, she paid a fee and um, is seeking damages in that amount. So that probably provides for her standing. So this is back before the United States Supreme Court. And again, uh, the challenge is whether this Texas plan, the Fifth Circuit did nothing different. It upheld the same plan that the Supreme Court two, two years earlier had said uh, was not uh, appropriate because strict scrutiny was not properly applied. So it's back before the uh, United States Supreme Court. Uh, so. We will see what they do, what they do with it. Here are the three possibilities, and there probably are some in between as well. The broadest decision, which is not likely, is to overrule Grutter. Since nobody's asking for it, and since the Supreme Court may be able to, be able to dispose of the case uh, on narrower grounds, it's likely that that's not going to happen. A narrower basis uh, for the decision, which would be helpful to everybody Believe me, everybody would benefit from a Supreme Court decision talking more intelligently about what a critical mass is. And talking more intelligently about what diversity is. And addressing the question of what diversity within diversity might uh, be. 
And it would be very useful if the Supreme Court would tell us to what extent we defer to an academic decision by University of Texas with respect to narrow tailoring. In Fisher 1, the court said we don't defer at all. All we defer to, uh, all we defer about is the uh, importance of diversity. Here is the narrowest and least satisfactory resolution. Just remand to the Fifth Circuit and say, boys, girls, you didn't get it right yet again. <laughs> Try again and apply strict scrutiny properly this time uh, around. So we shall see. So let me just pick up the conversation and just walk through relatively briefly um, three other cases that the court is going to hear or is likely to hear in addition to the affirmative action case. Uh, so one has to do with public sector union news. This is a case called Friedrichs versus California Teachers Association. The question here is whether public employee unions may require workers who are not members of that union to help pay for collective bargaining. And these are called fair, she fair share fees. Non-union members claim that these mandatory union dues violate their First Amendment rights. The key precedent here is a case back in 1977 called Abood. And in Abood, the Supreme Court held that public workers who decline to join a union can be required to pay for those unions' collective bargaining efforts, these fair share fees. They said it's not a First Amendment violation to require non-union members to pay fees to unions when they get the benefits of their collective bargaining. But they cannot be compelled to pay fees that go to any ideological expression or political activity. So there's a sharp distinction between union dues that are used for collective bargaining and union dues that are used for ideological expression or political activity, and non-union members can be uh, required to pay for the former and not the latter. Now, these California teachers in the Friedrich's decision are challenging this, and they argue that collective bargaining is itself political activity. It involves negotiating policy issues, such as wages and contra uh, uh, contractual provisions, and therefore, they say all mandatory union fees, fees raise this First Amendment problem. The basic First Amendment issue here is that we're paying money for something we don't agree with. That's a form of compelled speech. And this is something the Supreme Court is going to need to consider uh, in this Friedrich's case. If you look at the trajectory of these cases, this is a pretty strong challenge here because the, Sup the Supreme Court has a majority of justices who have been skeptical toward mandatory union fees, and they have issued in recent years a number of cases narrowing the uh, ability for unions to collect fees from non-union members. The mandatory fees have become, uh, there, there have been more limitations placed on them by the Supreme Court, and there does appear to be a majority on the court who are uh, at minimum strongly skeptical toward these. It is worth noting that there are powerful political implications, partisan political implications to a decision like this. This would significantly weaken public sector unions and public sector unions traditionally have been strong supporters of the Democratic Party. So this is a background partisan issue uh, attached to a First Amendment challenge. Another case which has clear partisan um, uh, potential uh, impact would be a voting rights case called Evenwell versus Abbott. And this deals with the question of one person, one vote. Back in 1964, the Supreme Court issued a ruling saying that's a violation of equal protection to have voting districts, state voting districts, which are uh, very too much in size. Right? So the idea, if you're in a voting district, the approximate population in that voting district should be about the same size as other, other voting districts, and therefore people have, uh, the, the vote has similar power. The idea would be that if you're in a voting district with a very small number, you have a more powerful vote because fewer people can elect a representative in that voting district. So the Supreme Court back in 1964 issued this rule called one person, one vote, which says that you need to redistrict to try and equalize those voting districts as much as possible. Now, the fascinating thing about the one person, one vote um, principle is that the Supreme Court never actually specified how you count population within those voting districts. Generally, most states have adopted the total population within the voting district as a relevant number that they need to equalize across the voting district. But some states have actually uh, varied from that and said, no, we're going to count eligible voters. So there's a pretty uh, small minority that just count the eligible voters. Most states count overall population. The challengers in this case say that they only, that the only relevant number should be the eligible voters. Now, the difference between total population and eligible voters in some districts is not going to be that much, but in a lot of districts, it's going to be quite significant because you can include in that different count um, 
uh, felons, children, but also uh, undocumented undocumented immigrants or legal immigrants who are not citizens. These are all groups that could be counted to a population that would not be counted if this relevant number was just the eligible voters. And therefore, if the challengers have their way, and if voting districts need to reapportion based upon eligible voters rather than overall population, there would be a very significant shift of electoral power within states, particularly states with larger centers with large immigrant populations. Think about California, Texas, uh, <coughs> Chicago area would be another one. Uh, so this again has very clear uh, political um, partisan uh, ramifications potentially. Um, the Supreme Court probably has three options in this case. One is they could just reject the challenge or return to the status quo. Uh, meaning states can decide on their own what they want to do. Another one is they could say the proper reading of the one person, one vote is you have to have uh, population as a relevant count. That would be largely returning to the status quo because that's what most states adopt on their own. Or they could actually say, no, you have to have uh, electoral districts based upon eligible voters, and that would cause a pretty important shift in electoral power in a number of states. Now, one thing that's interesting to think about in this case is although two of the options I just laid out roughly would recreate the legal status quo, it does seem that if the court truly just rejects the challenge in this case and says, we're just not going to tell you what, whether you need to count eligible voters or whether you need to count total population, states can deal with that on their own. It does seem like the status quo in that case would be more vulnerable than it was before litigation. Because if you think about the way any political issue in our current political atmosphere that engages with immigration, any political issue in which immigration becomes a factor, all of a sudden becomes very highly salient and becomes a major political fight. So right now, there's not a lot of discussion relate, connecting the immigration debate to this question about districting and how we district in these uh, situations. But if there's a Supreme Court case, as there will be, because the Supreme Court accepts this case, and it raises the salience of this issue about how we actually count these voting districts, even if the Supreme Court rejects the challenge and says, keep doing what you're doing, you have to imagine that at the state level, this is now going to become a really interesting political debate about how to do this. And you have to imagine in places where immigration is a hot button political topic, there are going to be politicians who are going to be arguing for redistricting if the Supreme Court allows them to choose their right path. Uh, in which immigration and whether to extend uh, more voting power basically to, to um, districts that have large immigrant populations, whether that's the right thing to do or not. Uh, so I think that it's interesting to think about the way this could return to status quo, but the mere fact of constitutional litigation, the status quo itself, could potentially be transformed by raising the salience of an issue, which a lot of people just don't really think about. Lastly, another hot button political topic, abortion. The Supreme Court has not accepted an abortion case, but there's a high likelihood that they will. The most likely case the Supreme Court is going to hear is going to involve a challenge to a Texas uh, abortion regulation. This past June, the Fifth Circuit uh, Court of Appeals upheld a Texas law regulating abortion providers that would result in shutting down most, not all, but most of the state's abortion clinics. This 2013 law that the Fifth Circuit upheld requires abortion clinics to meet the same standards for equipment and staffing as hospital-style surgical centers, and it also requires doctors who provide abortions to have admitting privileges at local hospitals. And these are the requirements that would, require, that would um, force a lot of the abortion clinics to shut down. By a 5-4 to four vote last June, the Supreme Court did say that they're going to block the implementation of this law. So currently this law is on hold. Um, but that actually increases the likelihood that the Supreme Court is eventually going to take the case. Five of the justices believe this is a strong enough legal issue that they want to have time to consider it before allowing this law to go into effect. Uh, they haven't actually accepted certiorari in the case, but it does seem like this likely will do it. If they were to accept the case, uh, the basic framework by which they analyze this question is a framework that comes out of Roe versus Wade as qualified by the Casey decision back in 1992, which is a question about whether these particular regulations pr uh, produce an undue burden on a woman's right to uh, have a, a constitutional right to abortion. Does it produce an undue burden on access to abortion? Um, as anyone who's looked at the standard will tell you, uh, it's a pretty open-ended standard. Um, there's a lot of precedent in terms of what the courts have done in the past, but it does seem capacious enough that you could see uh, opinion coming out either way, even holding on to the existing uh, standard that could be seen to do an undue, abortion, <coughs> undue burden uh, or not. So 
it doesn't seem like this case would necess necessitate, necessitate uh, a reconsideration of the existing abortion law. But this is the open question a lot of people have with this case, that there's a majority of the court who are clearly skeptical toward the right to abortion. And the question is, how skeptical are they? Just as the Wheel and Thomas have clearly come out saying that Roe versus Wade should be overturned, just as uh, Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Alito uh, have not necessarily weighed in squarely on this question. Justice Kennedy in the past has accepted a more qualified version of Roe versus Wade when he helped contribute to the Casey opinion. But the question is, where is the court now? They haven't uh, reviewed a major abortion case since 2007. So this is a case they're likely to hear in which it's an open question about whether uh, how they're going to come out and whether they're going to use this as an opportunity to apply existing abortion doctrine or to maybe revisit that doctrine uh, and modify it. So uh, with that, why don't we uh, wrap up up here and then uh, open up to a general discussion. Any questions? About anything at all. <laughs> I'll start it off. Um, so you were talking about how um, you know, the so-called liberal victories were really more defensive victories, and there was one exception being um, the marriage case. Um, you know, going forward, is there any area right now that's brewing that um, could also be considered an area where we could you know, think about it as a, 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 an event, a, a liberal victory on offense? Yeah. Um, no, it's a good question. I, I think the general category of sexual discrimination, uh, sexual orientation discrimination, is a ground where you might see beyond same-sex marriage, there might be some other issues where you can just say that yes, the courts are playing a role in changing the law, uh, existing law in different directions. But putting aside those cases, I mean, to be honest, it's really hard to figure out where that would be. Um, I think a lot of people sort of put a hope in this sort of current, current moment where there seems to be some uh, populist fervor on the left, you know, revived around the candidacy of Bernie Sanders and some of the um, commitment to Elizabeth Warren, that maybe there could be some ways that we can have litigation challenges that somehow tackle the problem of economic inequality, at least on the margin. Right? So that would be a situation which is there any role the courts could actually have to advance the sort of populist idea about the, the, the vast inequities we have in our economy today, could they possibly address that? Right. So that would be just as a political issue. Where do you see any possibility of saying 5, 10, 20 years down the road where the left might be able to mobilize? That seems like something you actually mobilize the movement around. The challenge there is, although that's a politically a hard battle, but I think a battle that some people say there might be some foundations being built, is that the courts as a tool and constitutional doctrine as a weapon in this case, is really ill-suited to doing much of an advance on that front. Right? The courts, even the most liberal period of our judicial history, right? say that the heyday of the Warren Court, they came close to actually using the courts to advance a uh, principle of economic justice and weren't really able to do much. In large part, they were just following behind elected branches that were pushing some of these issues. Um, so there's some people trying to think creatively about ways in which the courts might be used toward that end. Um, I think that's probably a pretty... Um, um, optimistic view to think that the courts are really going to do much uh, in that realm. Another point I'm just going to throw out there uh, and say it doesn't quite fit this is campaign finance. So what are the issues in which you can actually get electoral majorities to really get a social movement going that might actually influence the courts? I think a commitment to campaign finance, a skepticism toward the Citizens United ruling in 2010 might be one of those. Um, but that seemed to be a uh, I'm not sure how he characterized it, right? A counter-defensive, right? They've lost the battle in the courts. The conservatives push back in a new direction, and then you try and sort of regain. I mean, the best case scenario there is you regain what you were before 2010. Um, at some point, 10 or 20 years from now, that could be seen as sort of a, a I don't want to get too military here, a liberal counter-offensive, right? That they're actually gaining some ground once, if Citizens United is really stabilized into a new status quo. But at this point, I think that's still sort of up in the air. There's another area that occurs to me where the court's been silent ever since its Second Amendment decision in Heller, uh, which you may remember uh, held that there is an individual right to possess a gun in your home uh, for self-defense purposes. The circuits are all over the place. Uh, we will, I think, get a decision, uh, get a case up to the Supreme Court 
in the next year or two. It's about that time because the circuits have done a lot with it. And what's particularly interesting about it is that you've got organizations fighting on both sides, the NRA and similarly uh, gun, uh, similar gun support groups uh, are on one side, but there are organizations that are bringing much of this litigation and are fighting uh, in favor of gun control legislation. And the Supreme Court's got to weigh in. To give you one reason why, the Supreme Court did not even tell us in the Heller case what the standard of review was in Second Amendment cases. Didn't even tell us that. All we know is something more than rational basis, and that's going to turn out to be very uh, important. Can I make a comment about uh, something that uh, was adverted to? And, and that is, uh, the justices on the Supreme Court sometimes like to signal things that are of interest uh, to them. This happened some years back uh, when the justices in a case uh, whose name uh, Chris may remember um, signaled that it had some problems with the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And that signaling that signal came to fruition a couple of years ago in the Shelby County case, when the Supreme Court struck down the formula for preclearance. Uh, so that's one thing. In Abu, uh, the Supreme Court has signaled in that it's not happy. Some of the justices said we're not happy uh, with Abu, and that may result in overruling Abu this term as well. So that's a way in which the justice communicate uh, to with, other, with lawyers with other branches of government and with the public at large. I have a question. Uh, he had, oh, sorry. Uh, on voting rights, I, I'm not sure where this matter is. Uh, Wisconsin, uh, in its last redistricting, adopted um, a data-driven system which put as many, as many districts as possible, the 60%, it was based on voter registration, and they put 60% Republican, 40% Democrats in as many districts as they could, and then lumped the large majority Democratic districts, which they just sort of gave up. Um, I thought that was, it was, it's been challenged. I'm not sure where it is. I guess it's not the Supreme Court yet. Yeah, so this is slightly different than the voter rights case that they're going to look at today, which is just how do you count the number of people you stick in each district? This is a question about the use of uh, partisan affiliation as a basis for redistricting. Right. Um, the Supreme Court has really struggled with this issue. They've actually had some cases that squarely present, can you use partisan affiliation as a basis for drawing these districting lines? Because there are ways in which you can draw districting lines to advantage one party or another by the, the ways you're talking about. The Supreme Court um, indicated there might be constitutional problems with that, but they said we can't really figure out what exactly the standard would be to apply it and therefore, current, current doctrine is that that kind of use of partisan affiliation as a basis for redistricting is not unconstitutional, but uh, they struggle with it. Do I remember correctly that uh, currently that's viewed as a kind of political question, no judicially managed standards, mm -hmm. and it's, uh, we're not going to, the judiciary is not going to get involved. Of course, the judiciary is going to involved in racial gerrymandering <laughs> cases for a long time, but politics may be somewhat, uh, is, is, thought to be different in kind. Richard? Uh, there was an article that I read recently advocating that the Supreme Court publicly uh, display or disclose uh, what their votes are in, de in decisions as to whether or not cert would be taken in a case. And I'm curious your reaction uh, to that and what advantages or disadvantages that might be in terms of analyzing what the court may be going to do. I'll tell you one thing, I know the justices will not be in favor of it. <laughs> uh, I know another thing, uh, and that is you can get that information after the justices are dead. Uh, do you know the Library of Congress has the justices' papers and the papers of most of them? You should take a trip down there one day. Next time you're in Washington, you know, get advance clearance and go look at the papers of the justice in your life or find the papers of the case that you're interested in and see how the votes were initially. Uh, but I'm not sure. Well, Chris, what do you think of that? I mean, would you agree with me that they're not going to do it? 
Oh, yes, I think, I think they, they generally resist any sort of change that forces more transparency upon them. Yes. So they're probably not going to want to do it. So the question is, would it be a good thing? Um, I'm a little bit torn on this. I mean, so one hypothetical is that if you force them, so this is just, and the, the concern is, is that one of the, the, the Supreme Court expresses its power by deciding cases. But how many cases it decided to give in term, the number is actually very small, considering the significance of the potential of the Supreme Court could be taken in, right? So it's under 100 cases now, and it's tricky. So another major way the Supreme Court exercises its vast power is simply by choosing, picking and choosing which cases it's going to accept or not. So the idea is you make that step more transparent and recognize that it's very significant whether they accept the case or not, and therefore the justice should go on record about whether they're voting to accept the case or not. And there is oftentimes a lot of supposition about the vote for certiorari because it only requires four votes to accept the case for review, but of course five votes to win the case. So for example, last term, there's big questions about why did they accept the King versus Burwell Challenge Affordable Care Act? Where were those four votes coming from? Where in the end, it was a six to three opinion that Chief Justice Roberts wrote, right? So the question is, you know, who, which one of those justices voted to take the case, but then rejected the challenge? It's interesting. Um, would it be better if we knew more about that? Um, perhaps. There are some concerns that if you did force transparency there, what you'd end up having would be unanimous votes on certiorari in which the actual negotiations about what to accept would happen in the conference room, right? So they sit around and agree what they want to do, uh, and then the public vote is that they're going to be unified on this. We already do have, and someone feels very strongly against uh, dismissal of certiorari, uh, uh, you have a dissent, right? So we do know certain justices that feel very strongly about accepting or rejecting a case may express themselves personally. Um, more daylight on that. My default assumption on all these questions is generally yes. I think more daylight on these issues would be beneficial to us. Justices don't want it. But there is a concern that actually there are ways in which more daylight on this particular question could uh, encourage a sort of alternative approach, because I think justices do like to not have to go through their entire process of justification for deciding, for justifying why they accept or don't accept cases, when there are thousands of cases that are potentially before them, and then they want to save their analytical energies for those opinions themselves. Yeah, there are lots of reasons that a, a justice will vote to deny. You know, it's not worth our while at this point, maybe in a couple of years. Those things are hard to put in words, it seems to me. There's another possible case that could be, would be a challenge to the uh, Affordable Care Act, and it has to do, and I'm a little hazy on the specifics, so maybe you know it better than I can probably do. It has to do with a possible challenge to the release of funds without appropriate congressional uh, approval. Um, the Republicans are working very hard to develop that case, and I don't know if you know any more about that, because that's about what I know. Yeah. I, I'm not familiar with, with that. I think I've heard of it, but I don't know nothing more than what you well, that's, that's the lawsuit that uh, Boehner brought in a standing issue to begin right. with as to whether or not uh, he or the Congress itself had standing to attack a, uh, a law. Yeah. And uh, it's at the district court level now, as I understand. But it comes out of the Health Care Act right, because of the uh, alleged in improper authorization of the use of funds. Well, I'm not that familiar with all the details. I would surmise that there might even be a problem with the political question doctrine there. What would the remedy be? Well, they want to obviously overturn the act. Well, <laughs> is it overturning the entire act? Is that what the remedy? Well, the remedy would be uh, <coughs> that uh, the, the, the executive uh, went too far, and therefore uh, uh, everything would have to stop unless and until the administration went back to Congress and got authorization for funds to administer the American uh, administer the statute. It's a serious question. My, my instinct is that the Supreme Court is going to try to stay away from any more. <laughs> I, think, I, I think they've had enough, especially because they have 6-3 in a lot of cases. I'm imagining no one is anxious to revisit that. But. Well, the four justices in dissent well, but, but, they're, but they're pretty tough, and they're hanging in there no matter what. Right. But they're down to three after King versus Burwell. So <laughs> I, I'm, I'm thinking that. Any other questions? Maybe. Um, I'm just wondering a little bit about the, uh, that abortion case that you mentioned. 
Um, do you think it, it might it might potentially have any effect on like like shifting the um, focus of um, these um, abortion analyses, like um, like in the um, Casey case, the standard was whether it's an undue burden on the um, potential mother or whatever on, on the women. Um, do you think it might um, like like reshift it to the um, doctor in any way because of the way that um, these like like the hospital regulations are are doing? Yeah, I don't see this as having five votes to revisit the Casey doctrine. I mean, again, the Casey doctrine is, is open enough that you, I think the court can use Casey doctrine to come out to whatever outcome they want. I think that's pretty, pretty easy to predict there. Uh, so then the question is, is there a majority of the court to actually go further than that, to use this case as a vehicle to revisit Casey the undue burden standard? Um, again, we have two justices who clearly say yes, get rid of Roe versus Wade. Well, right? <laughs> and then the question is, where are Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Alito? Uh, I think both of them have expressed skepticism uh, toward Roe versus Wade, but exactly where they would come out on this pretty big question about jettisoning a pretty stable precedent. Um, and then you also have Justice Kennedy. Uh, mm -hmm. Justice Kennedy did join that Casey decision, yes. so he'd have to be tossing out one of his own decisions in order to get a five justice majority, assuming the liberals all line up as I think we think they would. <laughs> Uh, so I just don't see five votes for the big decision here. Uh, I think the likely outcome is that there are going to be five votes to uphold at least some of these abortion restrictions, and therefore, going forward, abortion doctrine will be applied more restrictively, but it's still going to probably be the same framework going forward. That's my uh, like what I'm saying is, do you do you think um, this will have any? Do you think um, they can just like fit it into like um, oh this is an undue burden on the woman or will we actually have to say oh this is more of a, a burden on the um, on the doctors? No, I think the framework will be the same. It'll be the undue okay. burden on women's access, and that's yes. the question of how they apply it. Okay. Back to the Speaking of counting votes, I should have mentioned that I did not that uh, in that Fisher two case, Justice Kagan has recused herself because she was working on the Fisher case earlier. That has implications. Mm -hmm. yeah, so you guys mentioned lethal injection earlier and Breyer's dissent in that. But if there's a lethal injection case, do you think there's enough votes to even hear that? Or do you think they would actually decide a case like that? Or do you think he's just kind of laying around? With so it was a lethal injection case, and it was a constitutional challenge to the drug protocol, three drug, pro three drug protocol Oklahoma was using. Because Oklahoma had, this is the backstory, right? Oklahoma had to get a new drug because the old drug, the drug manufacturers no longer allowing that drug to be used for uh, human execution. So Oklahoma had to go and find a new drug which wasn't as tested as the old drug. And then there were accusations that it caused uh, ex uh, severe level of pain during the process of execution. So therefore, there's a challenge saying that this is cruel and unusual punishment to use this particular drug protocol. So it was a challenge to drug protocol. And five justices said, no, this is not unconstitutional, what Oklahoma is, is using in this instance. Breyer used this as a vehicle to launch this sort of idea that we, at least, two, and Breyer got uh, Justice Ginsburg to his opinion, that we two justices on the Supreme Court have serious reservations about the constitutionality, not of justice drug protocol, because they had four votes for that. They lost, but they had four votes for that. The constitutionality of the death penalty, whole clock. And he wrote a 40 page opinion giving a lot of detailed analysis and empirical evidence for why he believes the death penalty is constitutionally problematic. He didn't squarely come out and say, I would strike it down. But he comes pretty close to saying that. And I think the idea here is you have a seed planted that has two justices' votes, and it's an invitation, right? We talked about shots across the bottom, invitations, that you issue a sort of small opinion. This is an invitation via dissent, uh, and I think Justice Breyer wants people to start talking about this more seriously and bringing cases. Pretty much any case involving a, a review of a death penalty, of a, of a capital punishment, could be a vehicle for challenging a death penalty. So we're going to have lots of cases. The court is always getting cases that if you have enough justices get together, they can use it as a vehicle to do this, to lay out the constitutional challenge of death penalty. So the, the issue is going to be always there in the offing. It's just a question of when the justices feel like they want to sort of weigh in. And then the bigger question is, is there eventually going to be a majority of the court to come to this conclusion? Interestingly, Justice Scalia recently gave a speech where he said, I predict the current, no, the court will, at some point in the near future, strike down a death penalty. He predicted Justice Breyer's uh, opinion is eventually going to be the opinion of the court. Uh, 
Uh, and Scalia was saying this sort of despondently, but he believed there's no strong constitutional argument there, and he's sort of fitting this in with the same marriage case, saying this court has majority justice who are willing to sort of push off in these new directions, which is not based in history and the Constitution. But he said the death penalty could fit in here, and he predicts that, you know, if Breyer and Ginsburg now, and at some point in the future, it could be five justices. So this is something, I don't think it's going to be this coming term. I think this is a long-term thing. Um, but it's something to keep an eye on, because if Breyer's opinion is, is powerful. And just kind of a follow-up question. Who, was it just, was Kagan and um, Sotomayor on the court at that time? What, what year was that decision after that? This was just last term. Oh, okay. This is just last term. Kagan and Sotomayor dissented to the Supreme Court upholding Oklahoma's method of execution, the, just the drug protocol. They did not join Justice Breyer's opinion, laying out the basis for constitutional challenge to death penalty. Uh, so make of that what you will. They were not with Justice Ginsburg saying, I'm ready now to think about this. Um, but certainly, you know, if you're looking for a possible expansion of Justice Breyer's critique, we we'll start there. All right, I think uh, we're on the clock. Thank you very much. Thank you.